Um, so I'm here today to talk about Rust. Um, my talk is called What's Rust? And it's intentionally a very uh, a beginner level uh, talk. There's much more advanced level talks online that you could take a look at that go into all the details of the internals of everything and uh, the nitty gritty details of how you interoperate with C and um, all the things that actually make Rust a very interesting language to program things in. But today I just want to talk about some of the high level um, ideas that you will find over and over again in Rust that make Rust interesting and that uh, getting through with me will help you to get, on your, get along on your journey. So I actually want to start by talking about something very different from Rust, which is Node.js. And the reason I want to talk about Node.js is a lot of people look at programming languages, and they look at programming languages sort of on this curve. They say, well, there's an expressiveness axis, and there's a speed axis, and you can pretty much plot a programming language on this curve. And you often see this when a new programming language came out. When Swift came out, they actually made one of these diagrams, and they said, look at Swift. It's so important. It's like outside of the normal curve. But the basic idea behind these curves is that every programming language has a fixed position on these curves. And the way you should think about things is that as you add more expressiveness to a language, by definition, the speed has to be decreased. And this is sort of the way people think about it. And in the case of JavaScript and Node, what people underestimated was how ubiquitous JavaScript ended up being. And so if you looked, for example, at uh, at JavaScript on the client side, you'd see that in 2005 or something, basically anybody who wrote anything on the client side was JavaScript. I have a little sliver there because I think in theory there was like some compiled to JavaScript languages like hacks or whatever. Um, but basically everyone who wrote anything wrote uh, JavaScript on the client side. And then on the server side, it was sort of the opposite, right? There were things like Rails and Django and PHP and Java and a few people experimenting with running JavaScript on the server side. So it would be very easy to look at this and say, well, JavaScript is not a very expressive language. It's basically the biggest joke in terms of expressiveness. JavaScript is not a very fast language. JavaScript is not very popular on the server. So obviously, it's basically a language you can uh, reliably ignore. And, but what people missed when they did this analysis was how ubiquitous JavaScript was on the client. And because JavaScript was so ubiquitous on the client, this actually gave people an incentive to change the position of JavaScript on the curve. So the first thing that happened was that V8 happened, right? And so JavaScript got much faster, very fast. Um, I should have put in this diagram, but there's a diagram somewhere that showed JavaScript getting like 100x faster or something like that in like a one-year period during the, during the V8 coming out party. So that was one thing. And then again, because JavaScript was so popular uh, on the client side, the JavaScript, the people working on JavaScript, of which I am one, did a bunch of work to improve expressiveness. So you, what you can see is that JavaScript has improved performance, and JavaScript has improved expressiveness. And this is something that people miss, largely because they missed an important thing about JavaScript, which is that JavaScript was ubiquitous. And really, the ubiquity is not the important thing about JavaScript. I, that's just an, an example of something that you might miss. The thing that was really interesting about JavaScript, the thing that made JavaScript popular on the server side, is that JavaScript was, or Node, was an enabling technology. What Node did was it allowed a bunch of people who already knew how to write client-side stuff to come on the server-side and feel productive very quickly. And even though anybody who already wrote server-side stuff looked at Node and said, Node is a joke, Node is hilarious, Node is, you know, has these performance issues, Node can only use one gigabyte of memory, there were all these problems, that many of which still persist to this day, the fact of the matter is that if you ignore the fact that JavaScript is ubiquitous, and you will miss the fact that JavaScript is fundamentally an enabling technology. It allows people who, are very, who already know how to write front end things to go do something that people thought you needed to be, uh, you know, you needed to be an enterprise engineer with 20 years of experience to do a good job at. And pe the fact that people could come in and do that work was very enabling for them. And I think Rust sort of serves a similar purpose. Rust takes this thing that historically has been this thing, uh, has been this stodgy thing where you have to have 20 years of experience in C++ and deal with all the quirks and all the crazy, and it allows you, as a person who maybe is just a Ruby programmer or a Python programmer or a Go programmer or a Node programmer or even a front-end programmer maybe, um, it allows you to go in and actually do some work that historically would have been out of your reach. And I think personally, this is why I think this is exciting. This is why I think when you go to Hacker News, every time there's a Rust post, people are upvoting it. I don't think it's because a lot of people are programming Rust just yet, but I think people are excited about the idea that they can do systems programming, um, and previously that would not have been a thing. So 
usually when I talk to people about systems programming, the first thing that I hear from people is like, I don't really think, that's not really for me. I, you know, that's not my job, that's somebody else's job. So I write Ruby and someone else writes the Ruby C extensions. Or I, I use Linux and someone else writes the Linux kernel. Right, that's somebody else's job. And then if you start prodding a little more, if you say, okay, well, you know, I really think you can do it. It's really awesome, it's like super fun. You get to really touch the metal, not like what people, you know, node people talk about touching the metal, but when you write Rust code, you're really touching the metal, right? And, but then the next thing when people start thinking about it, they say, oh my God, systems programming is really scary. Systems programming is hard, it's dangerous. I've heard that you can easily, you know, crash your system. People have experienced OS X panics or Windows blue screens of death, and they're like, that sounds like a thing I don't want to go anywhere near with a 10-foot pole. And then finally, if you can say, well, Rust is awesome. Rust sort of eliminates these problems. Rust doesn't give you the same, uh, doesn't have those same limitations. Rust is designed from the ground up to be safe and to help you avoid those kinds of problems. Then usually the question that people ask is, okay, so that sounds cool. I'm excited to be a systems programmer, but what, what does that actually mean? What do you mean when you say you're a systems programmer? And unfortunately, there is no actual definition that is good. Um, a lot of programming languages that have come out over the past few years start off by saying they are systems programming languages. I think Go was originally touted as a systems programming language, for example. Um, so I'm gonna try to give a, def a personal definition, and I'm sure there's gonna be someone that says your personal definition doesn't meet with the official definition, but I don't think there is an official definition, so. Uh, so here are some things that to me are what is system programming. So first of all, programming without a GC. So uh, once you insert a GC into things, there may be some hypothetical world in the future where you can program where the GC gets sufficiently fast, sufficiently uh, low impact, sufficiently real time, sufficiently low overhead that you can write systems code in, with a GC, but in practice that is not a thing that uh, is true today for the most part for most people writing in most languages. Um, then there's programming directly against the metal. And I don't just mean like you're writing system calls. I mean that the work that you do to write a system call doesn't actually add additional abstraction tax. So yes, you can write FFI in Ruby or many other programming languages and you will successfully be able to talk to the system. But there's gonna be a bunch of abstraction costs along the way that are not free. So when you're writing with a systems programming language, the idea is that when you're calling into the kernel, you're calling into it as if you had been writing assembler in terms of the uh, abstraction costs. Um, then there's the question of a runtime, right? So you should, the runtime itself should be very lightweight and it should be pay as you go. So it's not, you can't really avoid any runtime even if you look at like the, you know, the Linux kernel or if you look at uh, POSIX, sometimes you need locks, sometimes you need, uh, sometimes you need some kind of coordination and that ends up being some kind of notional runtime. But in a systems programming language, the runtime is both extremely small and also only used when you need it. Um, there's a notion of zero cost abstraction, which I, is kind of pioneered by uh, C and C++ and Rust has sort of picked up the banner on that. And this basically means that in general, if you're using the abstraction facilities of your programming language, if you're creating a struct, or if you're writing, you know, using a method or something like that, in general, those abstractions should come with zero or extremely low cost. And finally, the, I think for me, sort of, those are all sort of definitions. For me, the higher level I, the point is, a lot of times when you write in a, high, in a dynamic language, people say things like, well, you know, that performance thing seems good, but yeah, it doesn't really end up mattering in practice. But I think everybody has experienced times where it did end up mattering in practice, where you wrote a bunch of code, and yes, 90% of your, your app didn't end up matter, didn't have any performance costs, but then you had some area of your app where the performance actually mattered. And so uh, a systems programming language is a programming language that you can use to deal with the cases where it did end up mattering. And that's why a lot of people writing Ruby end up going and writing C, or people who write Node end up writing C, and that's because they end up with situations where they're forced into performance as a part of the domain of discourse, right? So yes, the, in theory, a perfect JIT could have gotten this uh, perfectly right, but they want to be able to say what they mean. They want to be able to say, I want this to be an intern string, and I want these exact performance characteristics. Now, a lot of times when, uh, when you talk about those things, you sort of uh, picture forms in your mind about what it is that I could be meaning. So first of all, it doesn't have to mean malloc and free. So even C++ doesn't generally involve writing a lot of explicit allocation and explicit freeing logic. Rust takes that a step further, which we'll talk about. But that doesn't mean, that have to mean manual memory management. It doesn't have to mean writing at the level of assembly language. It also doesn't have to mean that you're targeting a specific platform, right? If, you're, if you have sufficiently good 
zero cost abstraction facilities, you can end up with tools that let you target Windows and Unix and Linux and OS X and still have, uh, still be targeting pretty low level. Um, obviously, sometimes you may want to go and target the platform directly, but the notion of systems programming doesn't necessarily mean platform specific programming. Um, it also doesn't have to mean old school tools like handcrafted make files. And I'm not going to be talking about this in this talk at all. Uh, I just didn't have enough time to cover all the things. But uh, Rust has a 2015 era package manager that works like the package manager you'd expect, uh, does all the things that you would uh, come to expect from a package manager. And that's something that when you're writing C or C++, it's pretty, it, pretty glaring. Also doesn't have to mean that you're fighting with the old school tools, the system level tools. Doesn't fighting with the linker, fighting with your compiler. Ideally, the tools that you use, again, in Rust that's called Cargo, would do that job for you. And it also doesn't have to mean, this is the last bit I sort of alluded to earlier, it doesn't have to mean that if you're writing an application that you switch your Rails application to be a Rust application. It doesn't have to mean that you switch your, uh, you know, your Django application if you're to, write, to write everything in C. Everybody knows that you can take a bit of your application when you have a hotspot and write in a lower level language for performance. And I sort of see Rust's main, uh, one of its main ideas is the ability to take a piece of your application that, is, that isn't performing so well and not have to drop down into tremendously high cost that nobody in your, app, in your company can deal with just in order to get some performance. So Rust gives you the ability to do all these nice things um, at a low level, but it doesn't give you quite as many costs as you would have come to expect. So why did I start writing Rust code? So uh, something like 18 months ago or more now, felt like a short amount of time for a long while, but now it's a lot of time. Um, uh, so I, we were writing a uh, performance monitoring application for Rails applications, and what we did is we initially wrote the thing in the agent, the part that runs in your Rails application, in Ruby, right? Obviously, it's natural. We were hooking into your Ruby application. We need to instrument a Ruby application. Uh, Ruby has pretty good HTTP libraries, so no problem. We'll just write it in Ruby. And pretty quickly after we started, we got a bunch of reports from people. For the most part, it was running pretty well. Um, but we got some reports from people that in some cases there was very, very large memory usage. And so I was assigned uh, to go investigate why there was so much memory usage and see what I could do about it. And so I spent a week, a full week, full time, just looking at our Ruby code, trying to do memory profiling, trying to understand what exactly about it was, so, was using so much memory in those cases. And uh, I was actually able to do a pretty good job of getting the memory overhead down to a, a reasonable amount. But I realized that the, amount, the kinds of things that I had to do to make that work were both pretty painful and also uh, pretty painful, not, not something that I could necessarily rely on the VM to keep working in the long term, right? Any point release of the VM could have broken the optimizations. But more importantly, it was very difficult for me to communicate with future um, Skylight engineers about what exactly it was that I had just done, right? So I would have to have hundreds and hundreds of lines of comments just to say simple things that could normally be expressed in a type system or in a low-level language. So it was obvious that I was doing crazy stuff. And then the worst part was I didn't even get that much gains, right? So I spent a week on it. I got some gains, but it still didn't feel, it still wasn't amazing. And so uh, Carl, who is, is one of our co-founders, said, I think we should consider writing this in native. And so he went off and started writing it in C++. And I said, and Carl can definitely get away with writing stuff in C++. Um, but I said, well, for the same, pro there's a similar problem here, which is that the other engineers in the company are going to have to write C++ code, and C++ is an unsafe language. And the problem here is that we're asking people to take this code and run it inside their Rails applications. And if this, if somebody screws up and you get a seg fault, that's going to take down people's Rails apps. So that doesn't really feel tenable to me. Um, but we were in a pretty uh, tough bind, and so Carl spent some time investigating it. And uh, around the same time, I had become aware that Rust existed. And I said, Carl, definitely keep doing that because we need some solution. I'm going to take a week or two. And I'm going to try to just write a little piece of this in Rust. And the specific piece that I wrote was just the serialization and deserialization of the data structures into Protobus, which were some of the most expensive things that were happening in Ruby. Not Ruby's fault at all, just the library we were using was doing very crazy things. Um, and so I, wrote, I spent a couple weeks. I got a prototype done. And then I broke my back, fell through a ceiling, and was hospitalized for a while. <laughs> but um, I basically had shown that it was possible. And this was during a time that Rust was fairly unstable, had more, even more cryptic error messages than now. And, this is, and it was something that I was able to do as someone without a lot of, uh, a lot of knowledge in what, was, in what was going on, not a lot of knowledge in systems programming, not a lot of knowledge in how to write safe programs. And this, this ended up working 
pretty well for us. And the nicest thing was when I went to run to check how much memory it was using, it was basically using effectively no memory, right? It was using however much memory the code used because we statically linked it and like another couple of megabytes. But otherwise, it was very, very stable at very low memory usage for the thing that I had written it for. So for us, the primary reason that we use Rust, and I think this is a generally good use case for Rust, is we wanted to embed a, a native program inside of a higher level language program. And I wrote a blog post about this. If you, uh, if you look it up on the Skylight blog, just how to use the Ruby FFI layer to talk to a Rust program. So for us, the key things were we wanted it to be reasonably fast, but more importantly, we wanted to have very predictable low memory usage. Um, so that, that's my story. Um, Mozilla is actually the people who made Rust, and they have a sort of different story, which is they, uh, they've been writing C++ code for a long time. So unlike me, who had no idea how to write any kind of native code really uh, very well, they've been writing C++ code forever, but the C++ code is the bane of their existence. The C++ code is constantly causing security vulnerabilities, and the security vulnerabilities are, in, are always the stupidest, simplest things that you, you could ever imagine. So, uh, so Mozilla started working on Rust, and the uh, browser experiment called Servo, which has actually passed like ACID2 now and is well on its way to being a legitimate browser engine, they wrote Rust because they needed something that was really fast, right? They couldn't afford performance regressions off of the C++ that they have now. They really wanted something that was safe, and they wanted something more importantly than, and, and I'll sort of touch on this at the end of my talk, they wanted something that was parallelizable. They wanted something that you, that in which they could do experiments with paral parallelism. And safety and parallelism are kind of uh, related here, because if you want to write safe C++ code, you have to be very conservative about the parallel work that you do. You have to make sure you're in a really good mood with a, either a lot of caffeine or a lot of sleep. <laughs> um, you have to make sure that you really know what you're doing. You have to make sure that you're following all the best practices. Or it's very easy that for a parallel experiment that shows good performance results to result in security vulnerabilities. So for Mozilla, coming up with a way of doing parallel experiments while also having uh, good performance and safety was important. And if you look at if you look on Hacker News, there's been a couple of videos that they they put up there showing uh, off main thread parallel layout, so they can basically do things that other browser engines can't do. Not because you can't do them in C++, but because they're cost prohibitive for the best C++ engineers in the world to do um, at a reasonable time scale. This is something that like Google said we don't we you know we don't really think this is going to bear a lot of fruit. They stopped doing experiments with off main thread uh, parallel layout. And this is something that the servo team, which is like a dozen people or something, were able to do. And that's because Rust basically gave them the tools to do it. So with that said, how does it work? Because that sounds pretty awesome. So before I talk about Rust, so this is, this is Rust, Rust's logo. Before I talk about Rust, I want to talk about garbage collection from a high level. Just uh, indulge me for a second. So here's a, a pretty simple example of Ruby. And by the way, I sh what I'm showing here is sort of the a simple garbage collection strategy, but as I mentioned before, uh, the best garbage collectors in the world are not able to give people the kind of performance guarantees that you need, for example, to build a browser engine, right? There are still pauses that happen, and you have to end up doing a lot of work to get to the point where, you, where the GC pauses are not, uh, don't end up causing problems in cases where any kind of real-time notion is important. So like high-frequency trading, building browser engines, uh, games. So how does garbage collection, garbage collection work? So at, at a high level, here's a, a function, right? And the function is basically just takes an x and y coordinate, and it goes and makes a new point, makes a line, and then gets the length off the line. So it's basically making a few intermediate structures just to do some calculation, because that's a nice way to, to def describe it, right? So and it's abstracted that way. So the first thing we do is we make a point, And what's going to happen is that that point is going to be uh, created and put off into a big list somewhere, so what's called the heap and gets put there. And the second thing that happens is we go and we make a second point, and that point is also going to be put off somewhere on the side. And then we're going to go make a line, and the line is also going to be put off there on the side, but it's going to have pointers into those other, um, those other two points. And then we're going to go and we're going to compute the line, and it's worth noting that during this time, uh, even though we've finished computing the line, it's going to take some time before we actually deal with that garbage. And there may be other parts of the program that are making garbage as well. And so later on, we're going to stop the world. We're going to do some analysis. We're going to discover that it's no longer a thing. We're going to kill it, right? And so obviously, this is fine. Um, things like uh, the JVM and other uh, 
really, really good systems, do a pretty good job at garbage collection. There's you know, generational collect collectors. There's a lot of research that makes collectors reasonably good. But at the end of the day, you ha you're forced, when you have a system like this, you're forced to say, take this structure and put it off on the side somewhere and then let some other system that has some amount of overhead go investigate when it is safe to clean up. And you have to do that um, in, in programming languages like Ruby or Java or JavaScript. You have to do that for pretty much anything that you ever create. Um, there might be a few things like numbers that are special, but in general, if you want to make even the simplest kinds of abstractions, like a point abstraction, you start having to pay the cost. Now, what Rust does is Rust does a different kind of system. Um, now, I usually, uh, I talk about stack allocation a little bit, but, I, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'll just talk about it from a high level. In an ideal world, you wouldn't want to actually take those points and put them off on the side somewhere. What you want to do is say, okay, I see that you're going to call this function. Let me go back for a second. I see that you're going to call this function, and I can see that in this function, you're going to make two points and a line. So what you would like to do is just reserve enough space for those points and the lines inside of this function, and then when you go to make them, fill them in, and then as soon as the function returns, you don't have to do any extra work. You simply, you know, the, the stack frame goes away, and anything that was inside of it goes away. And that's, that's how programming, programming languages like C++ do really efficient work. I'll have to go back through my animation. So that's what you would like to do. Um, the reason why that doesn't work that well is that if, so in this example, it's pretty obvious a human reader and a computer in theory could look at this and say, ah, I can see that those points are not going anywhere. They're staying in this stack frame. So it's totally safe for me to take this thing and pin it into this, into this function, and then when the function goes away, it will go away. But real programs, of course, especially in programming languages with closures and data structures and um, the full gamut of things that you come to expect from a modern programming language, it's easy to write programs where you can't tell from, by looking at it that it would be safe to do that optimization. And further, uh, thinking about it just as an optimization that is opportunistically done, right? So if the programming language can figure it out, then great, I get the optimization. Otherwise, if I make a small mistake, then I don't get the optimization anymore. Um, these are not, this is something that makes it hard to be sure that you're getting the performance that you need. And so what Rust does is Rust starts from an uh, idea called ownership. And the idea, called, uh, the idea of ownership is so similar to how ownership works in the real world, which is that when you create something, there is something that owns that, that thing. And so I'll, I'll show you a, a human example and then some code. So here's me and Carl. The contrast is pretty, pretty high here. But. So uh, I go to a 24-hour store and I buy a book. And the store gives me the book. And now it's my book. Right? Now I, I get to decide what happens to it. And if I want to dispose of that book, I get to dispose of the book, <laughs> burn the book. I realized way too late that burning book is probably not the best analogy. <laughs> But it's, it's my book, I got to destroy it, and I know that that's a safe thing to do, and no one else could be relying on it because I own it, right? And then similarly, if I own the book and I give it to Carl, now Carl is allowed to dispose of that book, and I no longer should be, should be trying to access it because I've given it to Carl. So if I want to get it from Carl, I got to ask Carl for it. This is how ownership works in the real world. And from a high level, ownership is the right to destroy, right? So the, uh, if you own something, you have the right to destroy it. If somebody else doesn't own it, they do not have the right to destroy it. So that's a high level. Let's look at how that look, works in Rust. So usually when I explain this to people, people imagine that uh, the, the easiest way to imagine this if you come from a high level language is you can imagine building an, an API where you create an object and then the, you get the object back in some kind of ownership and you can pass that around and then maybe there's a method to destroy it or something like that. Um, in Rust, this is just the natural way that, that all things work. So here I've made a new, uh, I've made a new function. I made a book structure. This stru uh, book structure has a title, which is a string, and a set of chapters, which is a vector of strings. And I have a function called main. And the first thing I do is I go and I read the book from the file. I'm not going to write a function that reads the book from a file, but you could imagine what it could do. And then the next thing I'm going to do, uh, and then when I do that, I gain ownership. So simply by saying, make a variable called book, and read the book, I gain ownership. And when I say I in this case, what I mean is the main function. So the main function owns the book right now. And then I go 
to, uh, to read the book's title and print it on the screen, and then I get to the end of the main function. Now the main function, as an owner, is going away, right? The main function doesn't exist as an owner anymore. And what that means in Rust is that automatically the book goes away as well, right? So uh, the book was automatically assigned ownership when it was created, and as soon as the function that owns it goes away, the book goes away. And I th the main thing to note here is the lack of manual memory management, right? So even though this is equ the equivalent of going into C and writing a malloc, and then when you're done writing a free, that's not something you have to think about at all. You just thought about making an object and now being done using it. So of course, what I just showed you is not that useful if uh, only the main function can get access to things. So let's look at what it looks like to transfer ownership. And again, transferring ownership is similarly a lightweight and simple thing. So you can see that the function called print book takes a book. So let's start over again, and we're going to see, OK, we made a book called, uh, we made a book by reading into the, into the book variable, which now means that the main function owns it. And then when I go to call print book, because of the fact that the book is taken as a, just a standalone book, that means that the book gets transferred, ownership transfer. So ownership transfer is the default. If you take a variable without any, saying anything else, tr ownership transfer is the way that this works. So now the print book function owns that book, and it can print the title. And then we get to the end of the print book function. The print book function, as the owner has gone away, the book goes away, and we're done. Now you might be wondering, OK, so that sounds cool, but what happens if the original main function tries to read the book? So obviously you can see that the book still looks like, from the perspective of a normal programming language, the book still looks like it's in scope. So how does this work? Like something has to, I already showed you that the book got destroyed in the previous frame, so how does this work? So let's walk through the same steps again. So the first thing we do is we make the book and we are going to, the main function gains ownership of it. We then call print book, which transfers ownership into the print book function. Same thing as before, it gets destroyed. Now we go back and what happens is it says, no, you can't do that. Error, use of moved value. And you can see it also says, note, book was moved here. But it's important to note that this is actually not, I just showed it as if it was happening at runtime. This doesn't actually happen at runtime. This is actually a compile time thing. So the compiler says use of move value book.chapters because the compiler can see that you moved the value when you called print book and you tried to use it again afterwards. So basically what this means is that ownership is the primary way of doing things in Rust. And if you try to violate the rules, you get an error. You get a compile time error. But I think you can sort of uh, imagine that this is not a very robust system. Uh, you can imagine and if human beings had to work this way, uh, there, for example, there would be no libraries. There would be no, you couldn't lend a cup of sugar to your friend, right? Uh, ownership is, very, is a somewhat rigid system. So humans have created the concept of borrowing, right? To give someone something with the promise that you'll get it back. So let's look again at our high level example. So. Uh, I got a book from the bookstore, and I, say, and I am told by the bookstore, hey, you need to return this by 5 p.m. on Friday. Ah, sorry, I mis misspoke. So I have the book, I own the book, and I tell Carl, hey, you need to return this by 5 p.m. on Friday. I give him the book. Carl makes sure he gives the book back to me at 5 p.m. on Friday. Everything is great. So that's borrowing in human terms, right? Human beings have this notion of, hey, I have a book. I give it to Tom. I give it to Carl, and I can extract from him a promise to return it to me by a certain time. Libraries are a good example of this, right? In libraries, it's a formalized system. You get a ticket that says you have to return it by this particular period of time. So how does borrowing work? So actually, borrowing works very similarly to what we did before, but there's an operator in Rust which is called the borrow operator, and that's the ampersand. So if you're familiar with C++, this looks like you're taking things by reference, which is indeed what is happening um, under the hood. But the way you should think about this in Rust is that this is the borrow operator. So here, what happens is we start off by saying, give me a book, and as before, the book is owned by the main function. But now we say, we call print book, and we have that little ampersand there. And the ampersand means I'm not giving ownership to the print book function, I am lending it. And that means that the print book function is required to not hang on to that variable after the point at which it returns. So you can see I have shaded it gray, right? So now I have access to it. I can read the title just like before, but I am not allowed to hang on to it. And as soon as I return, it gets, doesn't get destroyed. It gets sent back. And now because it got borrowed and not transferred, I can go and use it like before uh, as, if it was not, as if nothing had happened, right? So this is pretty awesome. This basically means that I have a, the flexibility of transferring if that's what I want, if I no longer want to care about something, but I can also lend if I want. And one thing that's also kind of interesting about this is 
if you think about the programming that you write on a regular basis, it's actually rather, uh, it's actually pretty common that you call functions and you're giving them a value simply for them to do some computation with it. You don't actually want them to have any kind of ownership. But when you write in a language with references that are pervasive, you write in a GC language, what ends up happening is that every single time you send someone something, the programming language has to think about the possibility that maybe what you mean is for them to hold on to it. So there's all this overhead, but not just overhead in terms of the program, in, in terms of the runtime performance, overhead in terms of the human understanding, right? The human has, has to look at it and say, oh, let me make sure that I know that I'm not supposed to hang on to that, right? And this is the, the cause of things like memory leaks, where people hang, hung on, hang on to something longer than they were supposed to hang on to it, and that caused both sides to not know what was going on and triggers leaks. So, so that's borrowing, and of course, at, when the main function returns, the thing gets destroyed like before. So again, you don't have to worry about doing manual memory management. Um, and so this is good. It's good to be able to borrow things. But it's also important, especially in programming, to be able to borrow things at uh, multiple levels, to be able to sublease. So let me show the human example. So you know, instead of me going and buying a book from the store, this time I go to the library and I borrow a book. And the library tells me, hey, you need to return this by 5 p.m. on Friday. So I say, OK, awesome. Carl says, hey, can I borrow that book? And I say, no problem, Carl. You can borrow the book, but you need to return it to me by 4.30 on Friday, because i got to get it back to the library. Right? And Carl doesn't have to know anything about the library. Carl just has to know that I have told him he can borrow the book as long as he gives it back to me by 4.30, and I make sure that I return it to the library by 5 o'clock. Right? So this is, uh, th this, the nice thing about subleasing is that the abstraction of, of borrowing doesn't have to be leaked. The number of levels doesn't have to be leaked. You can keep subleasing as much as you want as long as everybody agrees to follow the rules. In, the, in human terms, this doesn't work as well as you would like because people are not so good at following the rules, right? But the nice thing about programming languages is that we can make sure that people actually follow the rules, right? So when I return it, it got destroyed. As <laughs> gratuitous book burning. <laughs> So what does subleasing look like? So here we have the main function, and we're going to uh, get a book, and the book is going to be owned by the main function. We're going to call print book like before, and like before, it's going to become borrowed to the print book function. This time, we're going to farm out the actual work to additional functions, right? just like you would do in normal programming. And when I say print title with the ampersand book, what that means is that I have borrowed the book. I want to take that book that I borrowed and lend it to the print title function. Right? The print title function does its work, returns it back, I move on to the print chapters function and basically repeat, repeat the process. And what the really cool thing about this is that you can look at any of these functions, and because of the fact that you see that that ampersand is there, right, it says ampersand book, that means that this function is borrowing the book. That means that without having to know anything else about the rest of the program, you know that this function is not allowed to hang on to this book past the point at which it was returning, it was returned. So uh, we go ahead and print, we return, gets returned, we get to the end of the function, that gets destroyed. And again, it's important to note that we were able to get pretty much the standard way of programming with delegating into multiple functions. We could break up the functions into small pieces, as we would expect. And we still didn't have to think about memory management, and there was no runtime overhead. right? So uh, we basically get the benefit of just passing around what are effectively raw pointers for, from the perspective of something like C++ in terms of performance. But we, at no point do we have to think about memory management. I think it's somewhat extraordinary to look at this and see the fact that there's, you know, there's strings involved here, there's vectors, there's borrowing, there's, you know, there's references, but there's no memory management. Now, so, so far we've only talked about read-only things, and read-only things are pretty simple. Um, let's talk about mutability for a second. So I borrowed a book from the library, and the library says, you're allowed to make changes. You, I'll give you, you can put a bookmark in it and say where you are in the book. So I borrow the book from the library, and it says, hey, you can return this by 5 p.m. on Friday, and feel free to change it. And then Carl says, hey, I want to borrow your book. And I say, no problem, Carl, you can borrow my book, but you can't, don't mess with the bookmark. Leave the bookmark exactly where it is. So I want to, you know, I lend it to Carl and I say, please return this by 4.30 on Friday, but don't change it. He returns it back to me as expected. I finish reading it, give it to the library. Library burns the book. <laughs> um, so it actually is important to be able to express the concept of, mut of mutability. Um, Rust has uh, all the things that I showed you so far immutable by default. So some people like that a lot. Some people like the fact that Rust is immutable by default. Um, and that's, that's great. Um, I'll show you in a few minutes why the immutability ends up being important uh, as a safety rule. Uh, I also like the immutability by default, but I think it, 
the safety properties end up mattering more than the mutability or mutability by default. So we start here, and the first thing that we do is we say, instead of just getting a book, let's get a book and make it mutable. So we're saying let mute book. Uh, in other languages, that would be like var or something like that. This is basically saying I'm allowed to change the book variable. Now, the interesting thing, interesting thing about Rust is that when you say the book is immutable, that means that both the variable binding is mutable, so you could say book equals something else later, and that's legal. But there's also inherited mutability, which means that any field inside the book can be changed, and any field inside of the field, inside of the field. So it's inherited based on this variable binding. Okay, so uh, this main function gets the book. That means it's allowed to mutate it. It calls print book. Actually, let me correct this because there is a bug. So it calls print book, and, that, and it says, hey, you're, print book, you're allowed to mutate this book. And you can see that I've added a bookmark, a U32 bookmark, which should be enough pages for anybody. <laughs> Two billion pages, four billion pages, should be fine. So uh, now the print book function says, OK, well, I want to call print title, but I don't want the print title function messing around with the bookmark. I don't want to mess around with any of this. So it calls print title like before without saying that it's, it's mutable. Now, it's important to note that when I say it's immutable, what I mean is not just that the book itself is immutable or the book's title or the book's chapters. I mean it's deeply immutable. So it's not, it's not like some kind of runtime freezing concept. It's whether or not this scope was given permission to mutate this. So it's sort of like a permission system. And it's a permission system that's totally static. So the print title function goes ahead and prints the title. We go back up. You know, we print the chapters. Again, we tell the chap print chapters function, I don't want you messing around with this. This is totally immutable, deeply immutable. We print the chapters. And then at the end, we say, ah, you gave me permission to mutate it. I'm going to mutate the bookmark, because you said I could. And the person who called us knows that that was a possibility. right? Then when we're done, we call it back. We send it back. And then we get to allocated as expected. So what this basically means is that mutability is a built-in concept of the language. And mutability is static. So uh, you can sort of think of mutability as a lock. Only one person can mutate things at a time. But that, that lock is managed completely statically without any kind of runtime overhead. And it's deeply, uh, deeply immutable. So now that I've explained borrowing, there are basically two rules of borrowing. So first of all, you can have as many outstanding read-only borrows as you want. So obviously, if you have a thing and you want to give it out to a lot of people in programming, it's totally safe to let a lot of people look at it at the same time. On the other hand, a mutable borrow is unique. You can only lend something uh, mutably to one person at a time. And also importantly, if I lend something mutably to somebody, I can't lend it to somebody else immutably at the same time. And the reason for that is that if I give you something immutably in Rust, not only are you not allowed to change it, you are allowed to assume that it won't change out from under you. Right? So if I, give, if I give you an immutable book, and then you go off and you know, you're in a thread doing stuff, you're allowed to assume it won't change. So if I'm allowed to give someone else a mutable copy, you'll be going ahead, reading some stuff, and all of a sudden, out from under you, boom, everything changed. And that's the source of the security bugs and uh, th thread safety hazards that exist in programming languages that make this kind of stuff so hard. So a mutable borrow is unique. You're not allowed to have any other borrows, um, mutable or read-only at the same time. And like I said a few times, these are all enforced by the compiler, not at runtime. There's no runtime checks that make all this work. Now, I said that you could have two, uh, two copies of the same borrow at the same time. Let me show you a motivating example for why this might come up. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to read two books. And I have a function called same. And that same function just compares the titles and the chapters and makes sure that they're the same. And it returns a Boolean. And of course, this is totally allowed. right? As we saw before, I can take a book and I can lend it. And I'm doing that here. And that's great. Um, but note that I wrote this function same, and it takes two books. And it doesn't really know anything about the books. Well, what if I go ahead and I say, I want to check to see if these two books are the same. Obviously, the type, in, the type signature in same has, is not asserting that they're not the same object. right? So this is totally legal. And again, like I said before, it's totally fine to have two aliases to the same read-only thing. So this is also fine. This is totally fine, no problem. You can check to see uh, if two things are the same. You can take something and give it read-only to multiple things at the same time. Now let's look at a, another motivating example for the mutable case. So here I wrote a function called copy. Copy takes a read-only book and a, a writable book. 
and it copies the title from the read-only one into the one that, into the writable one. And so I start by reading uh, book one, and then I make a mutable book two. So I read book two, and then I say, okay, I want to override book two's title with book one's title. So I pass book one, borrowed read-only, and book two, mutable borrow. So again, this is totally fine, right? I have a one read-only copy of book one, one write-only copy of book two. Those are different objects, so everything is fine. But like before, the copy function doesn't actually have it say anything about whether they're the same object. So what I can do is I can read the book, and then I can call copy and pass in the book and the mutable book. And like I said before, you're able to assume that when you get an immutable copy, that that immutable copy can't change out from under you. So obviously, this is a violation of that rule, right? Because you have, you have taken the mutable copy. You can go mutate B. And then when you look at A, it's going to see the mutation. But A is not supposed to be allowed to change out from under you. So that's bad. That's not allowed. And the way that that manifests itself is it manifests itself as a compiler error. And the compiler error says, cannot borrow book as mutable because it is also borrowed as immutable. So the compiler basically has your back here. And it also, you can't see that so clearly, but it will also say, hey, note, previous borrow of book occurs here. And note, previous borrow ends here. So you can sort of see what's going on. It gives you a bunch of notes that tell you what's going on. Usually there's a lot more verbiage. And you got to get good at uh, figuring out. Hopefully that verbiage will get pared down over time. But the basic idea here is that the compiler sees that you're violating the rule. And when you start writing Rust, I think it becomes, it's pretty easy to be like, I know better. I know that in this situation, I'm not doing anything crazy. It's totally fine. But over time, you sort of get used to the fact that when you have an immutable thing, it's really guaranteed to be immutable. You know things can't change out from under you. And you come to appreciate the fact that the compiler is not allowing you to say, to let somebody mutate something at the same time as you're given something that's immutable. And what's kind of interesting about all of this is that borrowing, at the end of the day, is the secret sauce to making uh, linear types work. So there, this idea of linear types is a thing that exists in the academic literature. Borrowing also exists in the academic literature. Um, but the only way to make linear types work where you basically have a, a owner and that owner is managing lifetimes and deallocation and all that, the only way to really make that work is borrowing. So when people say, if you, you, know, you go on Reddit and people say, you know, what, what don't you like about Rust? And they say, I'm fighting with the borrow checker. Um, the reason why you end up fighting with the borrow checker at first is because this whole concept of ownership and borrowing is somewhat new, somewhat different. It, actually, before Rust, it was pretty much only an academic concept. So you're having to learn the idea of maintaining a single owner and representing uh, sharing through these borrowing rules. So, so far, I showed you some simple examples that would be pretty easy to write in C. Um, but Rust also has closures. So let me show you how closures work and then show, talk about how this fits into the whole system. So here's a really simple example. I have a function called main, and I'm going to call a function called 3 squared. It takes a up to, which is a u32. It's going to return a vector of u32s. Um, that first thing over there is range syntax, so you, uh, it's a, just the syntax for making a range object, um, sort of like in Ruby. So I say 0 up to, and then I call filter. Uh, it takes a block. Uh, the pipe syntax is the parameter list for people who are not Ruby, because that's where the syntax comes from. Um, so you're filtering. You say uh, uh, it's divisible by 3, and then I want to uh, raise it, to, uh, square it, um, and then I want to collect all those things up into a vector. So one thing worth noting here is that each of these steps are actually lazy, which means that it's not making an intermediate vector for each step like it would in a lot of languages. It's actually uh, doing each item one at a time all the way through the system. And only when you call collect does it actually go and make an a, a vector out of it. And this is the normal way of working with iterable, iterable things in Rust. So we have, this, uh, we have this setup. You can see that there's closures here. Um, but if you think about it, uh, so, so this is actually pretty simple. So in this case, the i is actually just a parameter. So there's no environment. There's no ownership, really, that gets involved here. right? It's the same sort of ownership rules that we saw before. The 0 dot up to um, is owned by the 3 squared. The whole thing, the whole collected thing gets returned. It's going to get owned by the main function. It's going to get deallocated. Right? All the normal ownership rules. Um, but of course, closures are not very interesting if they just take their own parameters. They're, they become more interesting once they start using their environment. And so here's a different, a different version of the same thing, where I have a second parameter called log. And the second parameter is just going to get inserted. So instead of just returning the thing raised to a power of 2, I'm going to prepend it with a string. So I'm going to format a string that, that does this stuff. 
And the interesting thing here is that you'll notice that now I'm closing over string. I'm using string inside of a closure. And so there must be some rule here that allows me to close over string and not have things go haywire. Because for example, in Ruby or JavaScript, there's nothing stopping you from saying, oh, actually, that closure, that's a callback. That's a, you know, that get gets run an hour from now. And of course, an hour from now, that string is not going to exist anymore. So that's not going to work. So there must be some rule that lets us say, even though this looks like regular closure syntax, we can be sure that that string is going to be used up by the time this whole function gets returned. And before I explain uh, exactly how that works, I just want to say that the performance of that uh, filter and map thing actually ends up being equivalent to writing this code. So this is code you make a vector, you loop, you inline the filter, you inline the map, you inline the, the, break, the breaking rule, right? This is how you would write it in, you, know, you could write this in Rust, and it's kind of how you would write it in C with C style for loops. Um, but the way you write it in Rust with, uh, with closures ends up being equivalent performance to this. And that's what I meant earlier when I talked about zero cost abstractions, right? These abstractions through optimizations end up being equivalent. And actually, uh, just as a gotcha, I did a little bit of a bad thing here, which is that what I probably should have done is not make a new vector because that's going to keep reallocating as I go. I probably should have said vector with capacity up to minus one just so that I pre-allocate the right vector. But of course, the collect function, the collect method, which looks like this super high level thing, is smart enough to do the right, the right thing there. So when I use what looks like a much higher level abstraction, I actually get less foot guns. Much, I get better performance on average than I would have if I was just writing things by hand the way I would normally have thought to write them. Um, and a really good example of this actually is bounds checks. So in, uh, in a safe language, uh, you don't want to be able to seg fault because you index into an array outside of its bounds. That's probably like half of all security vulnerabilities are related to this. So whenever you index into a vector in Rust, there's an auto, it inserts an automatic bounds check, and that makes sure that everything's safe. And that's one of the ways that Rust is safe. Um, but of course, if you iterate over an array and do a bounds check, those bounds checks add up. But if you use map or filter or collect, then the internals of that map or filter or collect function can know that it doesn't have to keep doing the bounce check because it knows what it's doing, right? It knows that it's just iterating over a thing. So it does one bounce check or zero bounce checks and then just goes and does the, the rest of the work. And so what that means is that a lot of times in Rust, when you use the higher level of abstraction, somewhat ironically, you get better performance than if you wrote it by hand. And you get better performance and you get Equal, equal safety, right? So um, Rust by default adds these safety checks, but when you use the high-level abstractions, the safety checks get, can get eliminated. So the interesting thing about, I said, there obviously must be some way that this works. The interesting thing about closures in Rust is that they effectively follow the same ownership rules as the regular uh, Rust system that we learned so far. So if I have a closure and it tries to close over something in its environment, that closure is required to follow the same rules of ownership as a regular, any other structure that took something. So you can make a structure, obviously, and put something in a structure, and a closure is no different than a structure that, that took the vari values in it. Um, and the way that that actually works under the hood is that there's three kinds of closures in Rust. I know people like to troll about how many kinds of closures there are in various languages, but there's a really good reason. Um, there's basically three kinds of closures. There's the FN closure, that's the simplest kind of closure. And that's a closure that can't mutate its environment. It's basically not allowed to mutate its environment. And in exchange for not mutating its environment, it's allowed to be used across many threads, right? Then there's something uh, called FN mute, and that's a closure that can mutate its environment, but sort of in the same vein as the previous rules. If you, can, if you have a thing that's allowed to mutate its environment, it has to be used one at a time. It can't be used across many threads simultaneously. And then finally, there's a closure called FN once, and FN once is a closure that can only run one time. It's guaranteed to only run one time. And as a result, that closure could take ownership of things, right? So if your closure can run multiple times, then the second time it tries to take ownership of something, that's not going to work, right? It, the first run already took ownership. So FN once is a closure that can take ownership of things because it promises that it will only run one time. So here's an example of FN once. So here I have a, you know, I, I make a buffer, I have standard in, I read a line into the buffer, I give it a mutable copy. And then there, uh, what I get back from that is actually in Rust called a result. And result means might have an error, right? And so uh, there's the, the success side and the error side. And what I'm doing here is I'm using a function, the function syntax, the map function syntax to say, here's what I would like you to do if there's no error. Here's what I would like you to do if it was a success. And it will, that success tells me how many bytes there were. So I say dot map size, I take a, a function, and then I print line how many bytes, and then I transfer the, the buffer to another 
another function which says got transferred, right? So this is sort of the normal ownership rules. Um, I took the, the thing that was in my scope, that buffer, and then I transferred it to another thing uh, using the non ampersand syntax, right? And the way that this works, the way that this is able to work, is that the map function, if you look at the signature for it, promises that it will only ever call that function one time. And it's not just a, it's not just a, a unbound promise, it's a, it's a bound promise, it's a compiler check, right? So you can't call the function more than one time. And so what happens here is that it looks like just a regular closure, right? So from the consumption side, it looks no different than if you were gonna be writing this in Ruby or JavaScript. Um, but there's some guarantees on the consumption side, the person who's receiving the closure, it's making some promises that let that, let that uh, closure take ownership of something. And what's kind of cool about this is that even though there are these three kinds of closures and you sort of have to think about them a little bit when you take a closure, right? You, want, you have to decide, you know, am I using this in a thread? Uh, do I want it to be able to take ownership of things? Right? So you, you have to think about things a little bit. From the calling side, they're actually the same exact syntax. They look exactly the same. And that means, again, that you, um, most of the time you're, you know, you're calling things. Most of the time the syntax looks exactly as you'd expect. And, and uh, in terms of the rules that are applied, so if, you know, if you're using a closure type that's not allowed to take ownership, the compiler will tell you, like, hey, that closure's not allowed to take ownership, you need to do something different. So, all that's, uh, all that's pretty awesome. You probably heard that Rust is good at concurrency, partially because I told you that earlier. <laughs> um, so I want to talk a little bit about concurrency, how Rust thinks about concurrency. So, Probably the primary way to think about concurrency is a thing that people repeat over and over again, which is that shared mutable state is the root of all evil. And so how do people deal with shared mutable state? How do people try to deal with the problem? So one way to deal with the problem is you say, we're gonna use a system like channels or actors, and the channels or actor system says you can't alias. You are not allowed to alias. You're not allowed to have multiple things that, that uh, point at the same thing at the same time. You have to pass them around. Then there's another style of writing code, which is functional style. And the functional style says you can alias as much as you want, but you can't mutate. Mutation is disallowed. And because mutation is disallowed, threads are very simple. But actually, both of these are pretty unsatisfying, because, in large part because they come with performance costs, but also because the programming model sucks. Sometimes you actually want shared state. Sometimes you actually want mutable state. And if you're writing in a channel system, you can't have shared state. And if you're writing in a functional system, you can't have mutable state. And sometimes you need these things. And the Rust solution is a little bit different, and you can sort of uh, see the contours of this based on what I said before, which is you can have shared state, or you can have mutable state, but you can't have shared state and mutable state at the same time. And if you think back to what I said about borrowing, you can see that this is not anything new for Rust, right? If the rules of Rust borrowing were actually already roughly equivalent to this, right? Uh, you can have as many outstanding read-only borrows at once, that's shared state, or you can have one mutable borrow, that's mutable state, but if you have a mutable borrow, you can't share it at the same time, right? So the Rust rules about borrowing, which we already learned, which we already have to understand, they give us the ability to have shared state or mutable state, but not both, without having to learn anything new. So what this basically comes down to is you can alias, or you can mutate, but not both at the same time. And internally, the way that this is managed in Rust is that there are basically two kinds of types these types are automatic. You don't have to say that your uh, objects implement them. Um, and they're basically, one of them is called send. And what send basically means is that you can take this object and I can transfer it to another thread and that's totally safe. Um, obviously, I can't take a borrowed value and transfer it to another thread because I can't have any guarantees about when that thread will actually run. And the borrowed value, I, I said I have to return it by 5 p.m., right? So I can't give it to another thread because then I won't be able to fulfill that contract. And sync is, that it's an object that's safe to, safe to share across multiple threads. And what that means is that there, it's not possible for multiple uh, threads at the same time to access interior state and mutate it at the same time. And these, uh, these types are things that are automatically inferred um, for you uh, automatically. Most things end up being send um, in practice. And what, this base, and what it comes down to effectively is the borrowing and ownership rules, right? So the borrowing and ownership rules are enforced by these two uh, internal types. And what's cool about the fact that they're internal types and not something um, hard-coded, uh, not hard-coded to like, let's say, the mutex type. So the mutex type, for example, is sync, and that means that it's safe to share the mutex type across threads. The thing that, that's nice about that is that you can implement your own types that implement the sync or send 
contracts. And that's you basically saying that you guarantee that they have these certain threading properties. Um, so for example, Carl is working on a IO concurrency library, a general concurrency library um, called Syncbox. And so he's able to basically write his own primitives that do asynchronous I.O. and hook into the same system, the same set of compiler time guarantees that the standard library itself is able to uh, promise. So let me just uh, finish up by talking a little, by showing a little bit of the example of what it looks like. So here we have uh, a function called main. As usual, we read the book. And then we spawn a thread. And inside the thread, we print a line. So spawn is just a, a function that takes a, a closure. We print a line. What we're going to discover if we try to compile this is that this doesn't actually work. The reason this doesn't work is what we said before, which is that the book actually only lives as long as the main function, but the spawn function is, can run at any time. Right? The spawn function can run at any time. Now, the cool thing about this is that this is not anything special about the spawn function. It's not anything special about the book type. It's not anything special about any of these things. It's simply the way that the borrowing system, the ownership system, interacts with the spawn function, the types in the spawn function. So the, the compiler tells us the book doesn't live long enough. Now what we need to do if we want to make it work is we have, to, we have to say it's a spawn, and it takes a closure, and that closure is mo gets moved off of the stack. And what that means is that if you try to use something from the stack that can be moved in, feel free to move it in. So this is basically saying, I want you to move anything that has to be moved in into this function. Um, so in practice, when, you write, when you're writing spawn, typically you'll write move, because typically you want this behavior. Um, and this is, this is fine. I think this sort of reflects the trade-offs of what happens when you try to spawn something. But there's actually a better solution than this in Rust that just landed recently, which is, uh, I think, pretty cool and, and explains some things about how Rust works. Um, which is that instead of using spawn, you can use scoped. Scoped also takes a, a function. And scoped, and just like before, we try to print the book inside of it. We do other work. And uh, when we're done, we say guard.join. Guard.join is just going to return the return value of that function. And because of the way this, this, uh, these types are written, because of the way this function is described um, in its signature, not anything special about the scope function, not anything special about the join handle, nothing like that. Um, the compiler can tell that it is safe to use the book inside of there. And basically what that, what that means is that the compiler can tell that this scoped function, the function inside of scoped, is definitely going to be run by the time the main function gets returned. Whereas before, with the spawn function, we didn't know that. And this is not something that you have to think about, right? When you use the scoped function, you just know that you're allowed to move things into the um, you know that you're allowed to move things into the closure, and that's fine. You didn't have to write anything special, but that was handled for you. What is that does with your joins for it? Yeah, so I, I'm actually going to get to that. So um, interestingly, the join is good if you want to get the value out. But if you didn't type join, the default implementation of the drop trait, so there's a thing called traits in Rust, and you can implement them to do various things. One of them is the drop trait, which is like, what should happen if I get destroyed? Normally, it's just like clean up the memory. But you can add other stuff, like closing file handles or sockets. Um, the implementation of the join guard in this case, the default implementation is actually join. And that means that you can be sure that by the time this function returns, that, uh, that scoped function was joined. And that happens whether or not you remember to type join or not. So I'm basically wrapping up here. And I just want to throw out a few things, um, which is that I didn't get to talk much about the high-level productivity of Rust. I talked a little bit about closures and structures. But I didn't get to talk about some of the high-level stuff. So I want to throw out some things that you might want to look at if you're interested in Rust. So one of them is that Rust is it's not an OO language, but it has a lot of OO characteristics. And a lot of most Rust code ends up being written in an OO style. So this is um, an example of that. And just I grabbed it out of the guides. And if you're going to learn Rust, you should learn how OO works. The most interesting thing about Rust's OO is that the self parameter is mandatory. And the reason it's mandatory is that it has the same ownership rules as all the other stuff we already saw. Right? So uh, methods are just functions that take self as the first parameter, sort of like in Python. But the reason for having self there is, is better than in Python, which is that you want to be able to say what the rules are, um, what the borrowing rules are. And you can, say, you can say that it's mutable or not mutable and things like that. Um, Traits. Uh, traits are basically uh, kind of like mix-ins in other languages, but they're scoped. So maybe like refinements in Ruby. Um, Brian's going to punch me. Uh, so traits basically let you implement a, a refinement to an existing uh, type and have it and, and ha be able to use it with method syntax. It's scoped, and it's also totally static, which means that at compile time, 
uh, if you say like, you, know, you build a library like Active Record that says like one dot days, that one dot days is gonna be totally static, looked up at compile time, everything's going to uh, basically zero cost abstraction. I showed iterators a little bit. Iterators end up being extremely important. They're probably the primary abstraction for working with lists of things. You definitely need to learn how that works. The laziness is really important. Um, there's enums, which are uh, called a lot of other things in other languages. Um, they're like Haskell sum types. The coolest thing for me about them is that they can have their own methods, so you can implement, you can make an enum type and then you can have a bunch of methods that match on them and do stuff. Um, you can overload operators, um, which works by the trait system, so if you implement the add trait for your function, for your object, that's how you know what plus does on that object. So there's a lot of stuff that you would not necessarily expect from a language that was giving you low-level control over memory, but which is sort of kind of expected in a modern programming language. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much.